Hello viewers, good day to all of you. This is Dr. B.K. Fanny with the topic on power. So, in today's lecture, I am mainly going to discuss about the structures in the power. So, from superficial to deep. So, mainly I will be discussing about the superficial structures of the palm and followed by that the muscles which are present in the palm. So our learned objectives for today will be mainly about the introductory remarks of the palm. So how actually our palm is designed and uh, what are the functions our hand can perform especially with the palm arm aspect and how it is modified to perform such aspects. So followed by that I already told you that in the superficial structures of the palm I will be mainly concentrating on some modifications of the fascia of the palm. So to be precise the deep fascia of the palm so in that, mainly I will be discussing about the palmar polyolosis, flexor retinacula and mainly about the deeper structures which are the muscles of the palm. So in the first part of the palm lecture for today, so mainly I will be concentrating on the modifications of the deep fascia of the palm followed by the intrinsic muscles which are present in the palm. Okay. Now first of all, let us understand what is our hand. So our hand is actually a prehensile organ. So mainly the prehensile organ is mainly to perform various activities for grasping mainly then we all know that we use our hands uh, to take food, then to perform so many skillful movements. So we differ from the lower uh, primates. So the immediate lower ones are the primates. In what cases we can perform the skillful movements? Writing, playing music. Musical instruments, I mean music, playing musical instruments, then performing some arts and craft work which we represent our culture and all those things. So for this, the hand is definitely an indispensable organ. So it can perform mainly apart from the grasping movement. So grasping movement is mainly for capturing the food. So that is the main reason here why we are actually discussing about the grasping movements. And followed by that is the precision movement. So this precision movements is the one which we stand uniquely or we stand above all the other living beings on the earth or we differ from the primates, the other lower primates because we are able to perform this movements of the hand with our hand precisely. Now, to perform this precise movement, one major modification which has taken part in our hand is that thumb is actually present at right angles to the other digits. So it is in, not in line with the other four fingers or digits it is actually almost 90 degrees opposite. So due to this what happens is the thumb can oppose against all the other four fingers which is a very very unique and important function to perform the precise moments. So because of that our thumb has also got rich nerve supply. So when we turn the nerve supply, especially when we look at the muscles of our hand, 
it is the small motor units so what do you mean the small motor units finally a single branch of the nerve the finer branch of the nerve how many muscle fibers it supplies now for example if a branch of nerve is going to supply 100 muscle fibers and if you compare it with another muscle where a branch of a nerve is going to supply only 10 muscle fibers so that means the second muscle will have very precise control because the muscle fibers are getting very rich nerve supply so numerous small motor units the whole muscles will be divided into numerous small motor units this is for mainly greater control and to perform accurate movement so because of this what happens is in our cortex in the human cortex our hand has a major representation in your human cerebral cortex now not only to perform all the motor activities our hand is also a tactile receptor or a touch organ so it is also a sensitive or a sense organ mainly what happens is you can recognize touch so based on your touch you can actually identify the geometry of the objects whether you are holding a round or a spherical object or a cylindrical object or a triangular object or a square or a smooth object or a rough object so this is all mainly possible because of the numerous tactile touch receptors that is the laziness of the cells which is very 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 adequately and abundantly distributed in your hand so we can tell that our hand can see in the dark what the eyes cannot see so it has got only two surfaces so one surface is actually called as the palma surface and the opposite surface is actually called as the dorsal surface so here the various activities the hand can perform so if you look at from the stone age from the man evolved so mainly he has actually been constantly evolving and the use of tools so he has been using so many tools first with the stone age he used mostly stone then he came to wooden tools then what happened is a major evolution took place is when he started using tools with the help of iron okay so nowadays what happens is we have actually develop more sophisticated tools we are able to use these tools because our hand can perform these functions mainly power grip now if you look at the power grip so many is the a cylindrical grip when you are going to hold an object like a rod or something this is mainly of course you know in the cricket what the bowlers so mainly you have a spherical grip Hook grip again to hold when you hold a suitcase or a bucket, all those things you use this hook grip. And other one is the lateral prehension. Now, if you look at the power grips, here are also different types of spherical grips and hook grips are given here. Even the lower forms can perform this. So, the hook grip you all very well know the primates are monkeys, they can hold on to the branch. And for grasping this, all these grips are necessary. They need to grasp the food which is available for them. Whereas in humans, when we see these grips, precision grips, mainly the pinch grip and the tripod grip. So pinch is when you hold between your two fingers. If you want to hold a piece of paper, then naturally what happens is very thin objects you can hold in your hand with the help of this pinch grip. The tripod grip is when you use the thumb with the other two fingers, very, very an essential grip. What you see here, mainly in writing, holding the pencil or holding a brush to draw, or you want to play a musical instrument. Hence, only this precision grip is necessary. Okay. 
So we have just seen about the various grips, the power grip and the different types of power grip and the different types of precision grips which our hand can perform. I told you one of the most unique feature of the hand is the opposition of the thumb. So the thumb can be opposed against all the other four fingers that is your index finger, middle finger, ring finger and your little finger. Same way our little finger also has some opposing movement like that of the thumb but not to a very great degree as which the thumb can perform. So that is why the thumb is present at uh, uh, right angles to the other four digits to perform maybe this precision grip. So that movement is actually called as the opposition movement of the thumb. Okay. Now from seeing the hand as a whole, we will come to the karma aspect which is more important as compared to the dorsum of the hand. The dorsal aspect we have already seen along with the forearm. So deep to skin you have veins. So mainly the venous arch is present. Your veins start from the dorsal aspect of the hand rather than the palma aspect. The palma aspect mostly the veins are not present. Major veins they start from the dorsal aspect. Then of course you have the tendons, the long extensor tendons and then you have the nerve supply to the skin of the dorsum of the hand which is by the superficial branches of the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve. Okay. But apart from that, the palm R aspect where we perform so many functions has got very very important structures. So basically let us try to understand each and every layer of the palm from the surface to the deep as we pass on one by one. So it is a thick, long, hairy skin. The skin of the palm is called as diabarous skin. When you call it the diabarous skin means lack of hair follicles. So due to the lack of hair follicles, when there is no hair follicles, then definitely what happens is there is no sebaceous glands. You have only sweat glands in your palm. So a lot of sweat glands are there, not hairy skin, so absence of sebaceous glands. Then the skin is very very tightly adhered to the deep fascia. That means the skin is immovable. It is not lax as you see the skin of your face or anywhere else in your body. If you touch the skin, the skin is somewhat elastic and uh, what happens is it can be pulled to some extent. But here the skin is very much firmly adhered to the deep structures especially to increase the grip. So if the skin is going to move freely then naturally what happens is when you want to hold a firm grip of certain objects it might eventually slip away from your grip. So that is why what happens is the skin is very tightly adhered to the deep fascia. And you come across some lines, of course, these are all the creases you are able to see. And in the palm, you come across three types of creases. One is the flexure lines, which you are able to see. They are called as flexure lines, you know, because why it is so, it develops. Inside the womb, when the fetus is having a closing a fist inside the womb of the mother the uterus in utero when it develops. So because of this position when all the fingers are flexed in the fetus during development these flexure lines are developed they are mainly again to increase the grip. So you are able to see in the fingers the flexure lines this line, this distal line, what you see here, distal flexor crease of the digits, they correspond with the distal phalangeal joint. But this one is somewhat proximal to the interphalangeal joint, that is the proximal interphalangeal joint, and this is definitely also distal to the metacarpophalangeal joints. Okay? So they are called as the flexor lines. Then ridges or fingerprints, papillary ridges. 
So, if you look closely, observe your one, your own palm or aspect of the hand, you will be able to see these papillary ridges or fingerprints. They are present in the form of whorls or circles, you call it as, or they may be present in the form of loops, they might find a loop, or they are maybe in the form of arches. So they are unique to each person, one person's fingerprint will not be as the same as the other person. And they are also different in their different digits. So if you look to our papillary ridges of thumb, definitely it might not be the same as the index or the right finger. And definitely this has also got medical legal importance uh, to identify a person whether there is a matching of this fingerprint in a crime scene. Okay, so that is mainly what happens is mainly formed uh, by the dermal papillae which is attached to the skin. Then apart from the landless lines which you come across everywhere, they are called as the cleavage lines. On the dorsum of the hand, they will be transverse. Whereas on the palmar aspect, they will be somewhat vertical. They are called as the cleavage lines. So these lines are mainly formed due to the deposition of collagen bundles due to the skin. So, any incision which is done along the lander lines, what happens is they have a really good healing capacity. So, that scar that which you have made, the incision scar, heals uh, very efficiently without uh, making any mark. So, there will not be mostly any signs of your incision if you make it along these lander lines. Okay. So, equity, you are able to see the osteology of the hand. So, these are the proximal row of the carpal bones, starting from scaphoid, nudate, triquitral, and pisiform. And trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamid. This is actually called the hook of the hamid. These are the metacarpals, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. You are also able to see near the head of the metacarpal. One sesamoid bone which is seen in the tendon of flexor pollicis longus. Okay. So these are actually the heads of the metacarpals and these are the bases of the metacarpals. They are actually called as the miniature long bones. Then we have the phalanx. We have the two phalanx, proximal and distal for the first term, whereas the other terms we have proximal, middle and distal phalanx. Okay. So due to the skin, we have seen about the features of the skin. It is actually thick, not hairy skin. It is immovable and strictly or very firmly adhered to the underlying deep fascia. Okay. Then, so how superficial to deep? Deep to the skin, you have the fat in the superficial fascia. So, the superficial fascia, there is a considerable and variable amount of fat. They are loculated fats. So, that means they are actually present as compartments. Because from the deep fascia to the skin, you can see various ligaments running and holding the skin. So, in between these ligaments, these spaces are actually filled with fat, and that is why they are called as the loculated fat. Then, deep to the superficial fascia, you come a modification of the deep fascia that is called as the palma apodiosis. So, the deep fascia is modified in the palm into one structure which is actually called as the palmar aponeurosis which is the flattened tendon of palmar's longest muscle. Then you have flexor retinaculum here and one more modification of the deep fascia is the fibrous flexor sheath. They are actually some tunnel like structures formed by the modification of deep fascia for the passage of the long flexor tendons. So, deep to the power of aponeurosis or the deep fascia, you have the muscles which are actually present as the thinner group of muscles which forms the thinner eminence. Then you have the hypothenar group of muscles. Then, deep to the power of aponeurosis, you also have some vessels. They are in the form of arch, which is called as the superficial power arch. Then you see these digital nerves and vessels running to the digits. In a more deeper plane you go, we have the long flexor tendons. The deeper to that, what you have is the deep palmar arch and the deep breadth of ulnar nerve, 
and another set of muscles, the interosseal muscles. Interosseal means in between the bones. That is when they are called as the interosseal muscles. So once you remove the palmar hyponeurosis, you are able to see the thenar group of muscles, the hypothenar group of muscles, and deep with the palmar hyponeurosis, I told you the vessels are present, mainly in the form of an arch, which is called as the superficial palmar arch. Then you have the digital vessels and nerves. The tendons, while entering the digits, they are present inside a covering which is called as the fibrous flexor sheath. Okay. And a little bit deeper, you are going to see these muscles which are called as the lumbrical muscles, and more deeper pain you will have the interarchy muscles, deep palmar arch, and deep branch of ulnar nerve. Yes. So, we have removed the thenar, hypothenar, palmar aponeurosis, superficial palmar arch. The long flexor tendons has also been cut. Now we are able to see the interarchy muscles, the deep palmar arch, the deep branch of ulnar nerve we are able to see here, and one more muscle of the thumb, the adductor pollicis. Okay, so the, the deepest plane what we have is the metacarpal bones and the carpal bones. So lying on top of it, the adductor pollicis, the interosseal muscles, the deep palmar arch and the deep branch of ulnar nerve. So they form the structures which are present in the deeper plane of the palm. Okay. So as I told you, deep to the skin, we have superficial fascia which has got loculated fat. Deep to the superficial fascia, we have this structure which is called as the Pama Aponeurosis. As I already told you, it is a modification of deep fascia. And an aponeurosis, we already know that it is a flattened tendon of the palmaris longus muscle. If you look, it is somewhat triangular in shape. It is not a central part. You are, what you are visualizing here is the central part is triangular in shape. And it is easy to visualize because the central part is very thick. When you look, there is an also an extension of the palmar aponeurosis onto the lateral and medial side of the palm over the thena and the hypothena muscles. And they get attached along the ulnar border and radial border of the palm. Okay? But they are very much thinned out over the up over the thenar muscles and the hypothenar muscles. So the main function of this palmar aponeurosis, I told you, it gives attachment to the skin above. So that way it increases the grip. Then second thing is deep it, the vessels and nerves are here, so it is protective in function. Then third, it gives uh, some attachments even to the muscles. Okay. If you look at the central part alone, it sets two septa, one a medial septa, another one a lateral septa. So that way what happens is the whole of your palm will be divided into some spaces which is lined by fascia. They are called as the facial spaces of the palm. Okay, so now let us not worry much about the facial spaces of the palm because that we are again going to discuss in a separate topic. Okay, so what I mean to tell is the central part of the palm aponeurosis gives two septa which runs deeply to get attached to the metacarpal bones, and thereby what happens dividing the whole of the palm into three spaces the facial spaces of the palm. If you look at the central part of the palmar aponeurosis, the tip or the apex of the triangle is attached to the lower border of the flexor retinaculum. So this band you are able to see here is the flexor retinaculum. And if you come downwards or distally, it divides into four slips. One, two, three and four slips. So it splits into four slips for the medial four fingers. So which means there is no slip for the thumb, only for the medial force beams. 
If there will be a slip for the thumb, then naturally what happens is it is going to restrict the movement of your thumb. So that is when you do have a fifth slip for the thumb. And it divides into superficial and deep. So the superficial one merges with the superficial transverse metacarpal ligament. Okay, so that is the superficial transverse metacarpal ligament. The deep part of the palmar aponeurosis will again divide into two, which goes to the sides of the phalanx. It is going to merge with deep transverse metacarpal ligament and it gets attached to the sides or base of the proximal phalanx. Okay. So that is the superficial part which is going to merge with the superficial transverse metacarpal ligament. The deep part of the palmar aponeurosis, each slip will again re-divide into two. It is going to go to the sides that is and get attached to the base of the proximal phalanx and also merge with the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. So that is the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. So before merging with it, see it is again dividing into two slips, which is going to the sides or the base of the proximal phalanx. Okay. So it is going to give two septa, one is actually the left septa and medial septa as it told you, dividing the palm into facial spaces, which is attached to the shaft of the fifth metatarsal and the first metacarpal. Sorry, it is not tarsal, it is metacarpal. So only four slips and the fifth slip, there is no fifth slip to allow the free movement of the palm. Now, in certain cases, what happens is there might be a thickening of this palmar aponeurosis, mostly in the medial side, it gets thickened and the uh, contracture takes place. So therefore what happens is your digits are flexed especially at the proximal interphalangeal joint mainly and at the metacarpal phalangeal joints. The distal phalanx is free. It is not affected because you know basically this slip gets attached only to the proximal phalanx. And that condition is called as the dupytalis contracture, thickening of the medial side, mostly affected is the ring finger. Any inflammation may cause, so naturally what happens is the thickening of the palmar aponeurosis takes place and contraction takes place. So what happens, your medial fingers might get flexed. So proximal and middle phalanx only gets flexed, the distal phalanx is not affected and most commonly affected figure is the ring finger. So that is the dupytrins contraction for you due to the thickened bands of the palmar bones. So maybe the proximal and the middle phalanx get affected but not the distal phalanx. Mm -hmm. Mostly it affects the medial half as I told you and most commonly affected finger is the ring finger. So this is actually called as the dupytrix contraction which is due to the thickening of the bands of the palmar aponeurosis mainly due to inflammation. The next modification of the deep fascia which you are able to see here is the flexor retinaculum. So it extends along the carpal nodes. So there by converting this space into a tunnel, so osseofibrous tunnel because the roof is formed by the fibers of the flexor retinaculum and the floor will be formed by the bones of the carpal bone. So that is why it is actually called as the osseofibrous tunnel. So medially almost it is rectangular in shape and medially it is attached to the scaphoid, sorry, uh, pisiform and amid. So mainly to the PC form bone and the hook of the hamid, it is attached medially. Later it will be attached to the tubercle of scaphoid and crust of the trapezium. Okay. So they are nothing but the medial most and lateral most bones of the proximal and distal row of the carpals. First bone is scaphoid and the fifth bone is the trapezium. Fourth and eighth bone is the PC form and the hamid. These are the attachments of the flexor retinaculum. 
the lower bar of the flexor retinal column definitely in the midline it is going to give attachment to your apex of the palma apoiosis the lower bottom laterally is also going to give attachment of origin to the tenar and hypotenar group of muscles okay so the tenar muscles and hypotenar muscles are also attached uh, to the lower border of the flexor retinaculum so here we are able to see the flexor retinaculum so the lower border here the apex of the palmar aponeurosis will be attached to pos the palmar aponeurosis is removed so that we are able to see the structures deep to it so the superficial palmar arch the long flexor tendons so these pink ones are the muscles lumbricals we we'll complete later then you see the digital nerves so this group of muscles is the tenar group of muscles again getting origin from the flexor retinaculum on the medial side you see that is the hypotenar group of muscles this also takes origin from the flexor retinaculum apart from the carpal bones so what are the structures passing deep to the flexor retinaculum so it's a very narrow space through which so many tendons and nerves are entering into your palm from the forearm or from the wrist Now structures passing above the flexor retinaculum. This your palmar is longest tendon, first structure. Palmar cutaneous branch of this median nerve. The median nerve passes deep to the flexor retinaculum, but before passing deep, we give a branch which passes above the flexor retinaculum. Then you have the ulnar nerve, which is giving a palmar cutaneous or the superficial branch. the ulnar nerve and vessels the main nerve and artery itself passes superficial to the flexor retinaculum then you have the superficial branch of radial artery okay some bits they also include the flexor carpi ulnaris as passing above the flexor retinaculum so the main structures is the palmaris longus palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve palmar cutaneous branch of ulnar nerve Main ulnar nerve and vessels, superficial branch of radial artery. These are the major structures which are passing above the flexor retinaculum. Now, if you look at the structures which are passing below or deep to the flexor retinaculum, so you are able to see mainly the flexor pollicis longus tendon. Then four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and four tendons of flexor digitorum profundus 4 plus 4 8 nine tendons and along with it you can see the median nerve okay so the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis profundus flexor pollicis longus and these tendons are covered by the synovial sheath So, if you look at the synovial sheet, they will have two layers. One is actually the parietal layer, which is opposed to the flexor retinaculum and the carpal bones. The visceral layer, which is in more intimate contact with the tendons, and this visceral layer, what happens is they sometimes they form, not sometimes always, between the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor digitorum superficialis. They form a recess, a synovial recess. You are able to see the folding of the visceral layer in between these two tendons. Flexor carpi radialis actually passes in a separate compartment. Okay. Laterally, if you look at the flexor retinaculum, it gives another slip, deeper slip, which goes and gets attached to the groove on the trapezium. To attach to the groove on the trapezium, the separate compartment for the flexor carpi radialis. The synovial sheath around the flexor pollicis longus is actually called as the radial bursa, and the synovial convex sheath for the digitorum superficialis and profundus is actually called as the ulnar bursa. So again, about the radial bursa and ulnar bursa, we are going to discuss separately while we deal with the facial spaces of the palm. So as I told you, the flexor carpi radialis passes. In a separate compartment. Okay. Carpal tunnel syndrome. 
again we have discussed well and enough about this carpal tunnel syndrome compression of the median nerve inside this osteofibrous tunnel is actually called as the carpal tunnel syndrome so it is mainly opposed to the deep surface of the flexor retinaculum and between the tendons of flexor deuterum superficialis when the nerve is compressed then it might produce some symptoms which is actually called as the carpal tunnel syndrome it might be due to mainly any infection or inflammation of the tendons so if the synovial sheet is inflamed it is actually called as synovitis stenosynovitis okay because with the simple cell synovitis it may also refer to the inflammation of the synovial membrane lining the joints so this is actually stenosynovitis which means inflammation of the tendons inflammation of the synovial sheath covering the tendons so callus formation so which means thickening or hard calcium like deposition sometimes the tendons may get hard and very much or if there is any fracture on a outstretched hand your carpal bones may get fracture so all this might compress your median nerve and it might lead to symptoms in thumb deformity which is wasting of the thenar muscle so this thenar eminence on the bulge which you see gets flattened out the thumb is extended adducted and laterally rotated so that means it will be present in line with the other four fingers not to be opposed and loss of sensations of the lateral three and a half digits but what happens is the sensation over the skin of the palm especially over the thenar eminence and central part of the palm is intact that sensation is not lost the reason is because the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve actually passes above the flexor retinaculum so it is not compressed so with this you can easily come to a diagnosis that if the sensation above the skin of the palm is intact over the thenar eminence but the thenar muscles are getting wasted then the median nerve is damaged at the region of the carpal tunnel so we have seen the modification of the palmar aponeurosis and we have seen about the modifications of the flexor retinaculum these two are again an expected short notes so you should be thorough about the palmar aponeurosis and the flexor retinaculum you should write about the origin insertion of palmar aponeurosis or it divides into four steps and functions of the palmar aponeurosis flexor retinaculum its attachments you should write followed by mainly you should write about what are the structures passing superficial to the flexor retinaculum and what are the structures passing deep to the flexor retinaculum and applied anatomy is carpal tunnel syndrome the next modification of deep fascia is the fibrous flexor sheath of the fingers which you are able to see here they extend from the head of the metacarpals to the base of the distal phalanx okay they form a, again a osteofibrous tunnel for the passage of the tendons that is the tendons of the flexor deuterum superficialis and flexor deuterum profundus so the main function of this flexor retinaculum and the fibrous flexor sheath is to prevent the bending or bootstringing of the tendons while we use our digits during our flexion mainly or extension these tendons should not move out of its line so it should not bend laterally so due to this reason what happens the fibrous flexor sheath is present and you see a fibrous tunnel containing the long flexor tendons If you look at this fibrous flexor sheath, it is thick over the phalanges, but it is somewhat thin over the joints. That is, at the level of metacarpal phalangeal and proximal and distal interphalangeal joints, there you are able to see only annular fibers. At other places, you will be able to see the cruciate or cast fibers. Okay. So you have two types of fibers in the flexor sheets. So that is your annular fibers as well as the cruciate fibers, so which is thin opposite the metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal joints. 
Now deep to the fibrous plexuses, the tendons they run and they again have their own synovial sheath. That's so the blue color one is because of the synovial sheath. The synovial sheath of little finger is again continuous with the common flexor sheath of the other tendons. But for the other three fingers, it is actually blind. It is not having connection with this ulnar bursa. So this flexor sheath is for the ulnar bursa and radial bursa is the synovial sheath for the thumb. So is it clear to you about the fibrous flexor sheath? What is the function of the fibrous flexor sheath? So mainly it is for holding the tendons in position during the flexion. So we pass on to the next uh, aspect of this lecture, the muscles of the hand. So mainly the muscles are grouped into thena muscles. You are able to see here around the thena remnants, three muscles you see here which forms the thena remnants. And one more muscle which is related to the thumb present on a deeper plane is the adductor pollicis. Then hypothena muscles, again there are three muscles, 3 plus 3 6 and adductor pollicis is actually 7. Then one subcutaneously one muscle, this is almost a vestigial muscle we can tell, pavaris brevis. Followed by you have four lumbricals and deep feet you have the palmar intrasia and dorsal intrasia. Four lumbricals, four palmar, four dorsal, twelve muscles. So totally you have twenty muscles in the hand. They are called as intrinsic muscles because they originate within the hand and they end within the hand. So they don't cross to the other region. So that is why they are called as the intrinsic muscles of the hand. So let us see these muscles one by one quickly. The thena muscles, three muscles maybe you are able to see here. The most lateral one is the abductor pollicis brevis. The medial to that you see is the flexor pollicis brevis. And deep to these two you see the opponent's pollicis. These three muscles are called as the thenar muscles. They form the thenar eminence. And more deeper to these muscles, you have one more that is the adductor pollicis. Now, first coming to the adductor pollicis brevis, because you also have adductor pollicis longus, which comes from the extensor compartment. So, origin from the flexor retinaculum and also from the trapezium and scaphoid bone. It is going to get inserted into the lateral side of the base of the proximal phalanx. So, to the lateral side of the base of proximal phalanx along with the tendon of extensor pollicis longus. So, again it has a sesamoid bone within this tendon. Okay. So, that is the origin of flexor retinaculum and tuberculum scaphoid and trapezium getting inserted into the lateral side of the base of the proximal phalanx. Its main action is abduction and also it performs the one more action apart from the abduction so that is the medial rotation okay so abduction takes place at the metacarpophalangeal joint okay. you also have abductor pollicis longus okay so the next one so here I able to see the abductor pollicis brevis muscle which we have already seen. Next to the scaphoid and crust of trapezium going to the base of the proximal phalanx. So they mainly bring about when they act abduction and they also bring about the medial rotation of your thumb acting in the metacarpophalangeal joint. Next muscle you see flexor pollicis brevis which is present immediately medial to the abductor pollicis brevis. It has got two bits. The superficial head which is arising from the flexor retinaculum and the trapezium muscle and it has got a deep head from the trapezoid and the capitate bone. Okay, so trapezoid and the capitate bone which arises. Again it is getting inserted into the lateral side of the base of the proximal phalanx. Main action, flexion of thumb. Okay. So mainly it is the fraction of the thumb and superficial head is supplied by medial nerve, deep head will be supplied by the ulnar nerve. So again it can be considered as a hybrid muscle. Okay. 
flexor pollicis brevis remember we also have flexor pollicis longus the next muscle which we are going to see is the opponent pollicis it is here hidden from your view only you can see the abductor pollicis brevis and the flexor pollicis brevis opponent pollicis arises again from the flexor retinaculum and the trapezium insertion into the lateral half of first metacarp it is not into the proximal phalanx instead it is inserted into the lateral part of the palmar surface of the metacarpal bone the main action is opposition of the thumb so now we have removed the flexor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis brevis so deep to that we are able to see the opponent pollicis which is arising from flexor retinaculum this tcl is the transverse carpal ligament this is called as the palmar carpal or transverse carpal ligament and more deeper plane this is flexor pollicis longus tendon and this should be your adductor pollicis muscle okay so see here when you look at the opponent pollicis it is actually getting inserted into the base of the lateral surface of the first metacarpal bone mainly it is involved in opposition action the next muscle which is present in a more deeper plane is the adductor pollicis consists of two heads and oblique head and a transverse head so two heads oblique and a transverse head arising oblique head which is actually arising from your capitate and base of the second and third metacarpal bones whereas the transverse head arising from the third metacarpal bone so this one is a transverse head and this is the oblique head it is getting inserted into the medial side of the base of the proximal phalanx so the function is adduction and also with the dorsal digital expansion so dorsal digital expansion again we have seen uh elaborately in our uh, previous forearm classes okay so two heads transverse head and oblique head getting inserted into the medial side whereas all the three muscles we have seen of the tenar ligaments getting inserted into the lateral side either to the proximal phalanx or to the metacarpal bones okay and this is mainly supplied by the deep branch of ulnar nerve this adductor pollicis is also called as the graveyard of ulnar nerve which means finally the ulnar nerve ends there by supplying these adductor pollicis muscles Main action is adduction of the thumb in a flexed thumb. Okay. So we have seen about the tenar muscles. Now coming to the hypotenar muscles. The first muscle we are able to see is the palmaris brevis. The other three muscles are same. Like you have pollicis brevis. Instead of that, you put minimi brevis, digiti minimi brevis. Up to the digiti minimi flexor. digiti minimi opponens digiti minimi instead of pollicis you put minimi palmaris brevis is somewhat subcutaneous immediately deep to the skin you see the more superficial plane and uh, this muscle is somewhat vestigial in humans mostly it can be missed out within the fat hardly you can see three or four fibers it is not as big as depicted in your uh, atlases or your diagrams when you come across in the textbooks so from the flexor retinaculum and also from the palmar aponeurus is getting originated yet it is in the skin it is mainly responsible for consolidating the skin of the hypotenar eminence okay so gathering the skin of the hypotenar eminence is mainly by the palmar aponeurus and it is supplied by the superficial branch of ulnar nerve not the deep branch it is the superficial branch that you should note here why because it is present subcutaneous okay so mainly make the skin of the hypotenar eminence more prominent so that's the palmaris brevis muscle for you you are able to see the ulnar nerve and artery which is passing deep to the palmaris brevis muscle So coming to the next muscle, you see here medial most muscle is the abductor digiti minimi. So that is the abductor digiti minimi again getting originating from the pisiform and the pisohamid ligament. 
it is associated to the under side of the base of the proximal phalanx. So here, the lateral side for the inner muscles, here the under side for the base of the proximal phalanx. Abduction of the little finger. So it is an abductor of the little finger. Flexor digital minimum, which is present medial to the abductor digital minimum, you are able to see here. This is actually the flexor digital minimum originating from flexor retinaculum and hook of amid. Again, to the ulnar side of the base of the proximal phalanx of the little finger. Okay. So, base of the proximal phalanx of the little finger. Flexion of the little finger. So we have seen about abductor digital minima, then we have seen about the flexor digital minima. Coming to the next muscle, opponent's digital minima, you are able to see here, this is the opponent's digital minima. Arising from the flexor retinaculum hook of amid, again getting inserted into the medial side of the base of the fifth metacarpal. So shaft of fifth metacarpal, same as that of the Opponent's policies. Only thing is that is what happens is it is to the first metacarpal here is to the fifth metacarpal. But one thing you are able to see here, that it is to the ulnar's that that is to the radial side here it is to the ulnar side. Okay. Sorry. Uh, opponent's policies also gets inserted into the ulnar side. So flexes and laterally rotates the ring, sorry, little finger. Okay. So the main function is flexion and lateral rotation of the little finger, which is the action of the opponent's policies. Whereas in case of the thumb, it is going to perform the medial rotation apart from the opposition. Okay. Now coming to the next set of muscles, intrinsic muscles. The lumbricals, they are very important because the lumbricals and intrashe again they can be expected as a separate short mode. They are four in numbers, lumbrical one, two, three, four, and they are numbered from lateral to medium. Okay. They are called as lumbricals or worm-like muscles because they represent ascaris lumbricoides. Okay. Four in number. Lateral to medial, they are number. First two, you can see they are uripinate muscles, and the last third and fourth are bipinate muscles. They originate from the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus. Okay. Two uripinate and two bipinate muscles. The first two will be supplied by the median nerve, the third and fourth will be supplied by the ulnar nerve. Okay. Usually, sometimes. A variation might take place between the second and third. Sometimes the second one might be supplied by alar nerve itself. First two by the median nerve, the second and sorry, the third and fourth lumbrical is by the alar nerve. So from the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus, you are able to see here that is the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus, which is getting inserted into the base of the distal phalanx. Okay. Whereas the flexor digitorum superficialis, they split and gets inserted into the sides of the middle phalanx. Fine. This is the first lumbrical which is arising from the radial side and getting again inserted in the radial side. We are able to see here. Proximal phalanx and also into the dorsal digital expansion. So inserted into the dorsal digital expansion for the radial side of all the four lumbricals, one, two, three, four, all to the radial side. Okay. First one arises from the radial side. Second one also arises, second lumbrical from the radial side of the flexor digitorum profundus to the second digit. Sorry, that is to the middle finger. On the second, it should be the third digit. Third and fourth from the adjacent sides. So that is why they are bipinate muscles. The insertion they get inserted into the dorsal digital expansion and to the sides of the base of the proximal phalanx. They are actually called as link muscles. That means they are going to link the flexor and extensor tendons. 
flexor and extensor tendons. They are called as the link muscles through the dorsal digital expansion. So they bring about the flexion at metacarpophalangeal joints and extension at the interphalangeal joints. So this is very much necessary to perform certain movements, especially while writing on the skill moves. Okay, flexion at metacarpophalangeal and extension at interphalangeal joint. So up and down strokes of the digits is mainly performed by this lumbrical muscles. These tendons again pass inside the facial canal. They are actually called as the lumbrical canals. So inside the facial canals, what happens is these lumbrical muscles they pass and gets inserted into the dorsal digital expansion. They are also called as link muscles. I told you why they are called as link muscles. Coming to the next group of muscles, palma interosci. Again, they are four in number. Four palma interosci. They are again so numbered from lateral to medial. Okay. So from lateral to medial, what you have is the first, second, third, and fourth palma interosci. Pad. P for palma interosci, A D for adduction. So all palma interosci are adductors of the digits. There is no palma interosci for the middle finger because the middle finger serves as the axis of the hand. To which the other fingers they adapt. So the middle finger cannot be adapted onto itself. If it moves either ways, then it is abduction. So there is no adductor or palma interosci for the middle finger. All the four palma interosci are supplied with the deep branch of the ulna nerve. So you are able to see first palma, second, third, and fourth. All the four palma interosci are unipinnate muscles. No power interosci for the middle finger because when you adduct all the remaining four digits, they adduct towards the middle finger. First power interosci from the shaft, Allah border, again getting inserted into the base of the proximal phalanx to the dorsal digital expansion. Second one again from the Allah aspect, third and fourth, sorry, uh, Allah aspect, third and fourth from the radial aspects. From the metacarp, side of the metacarpals. First two from the ulnar aspect, the next two from the radial aspects. Okay, insertion to the respective sides of corresponding digits through dorsal digital expansion and base of proximal phalanx. Action they are adductors and they also perform flexion at metacarpophalangeal joints and extension at the interphalangeal joints. So that is about the palmar interosci. Next. Coming to the dorsal interosci, they are also four in number. All four dorsal interosci, they are bipinnate muscles. They are abductors. So that B for dorsal interosci, A B for abductors. Okay. So here again, you are able to see this is for the second digit, one dorsal interosci. The two dorsal interosci for the middle digit because it has to be abducted on either ways. Then again for the Fourth digit or ring finger, you have one dorsal interosci. There is no dorsal interosci for the thumb and the little fingers because they have their own abductor digiti minimi and abductor pollicis brevis. Abductors all four supplied by deep branch of ulnar nerve. Okay, all are bipinnate muscles. Okay, so two. Dorsal interosci for the middle finger. So from the adjacent sides of the shaft of the metacarpals, so first one the adjacent side of first and second, same with second, third, third, fourth, and fourth, fifth. First dorsal interosci getting inserted into the radial side. Second dorsal interosci getting again inserted into the radial side of the middle finger. Third dorsal interosci into the ulnar side of the middle finger. And fourth dorsal interosci into the ulnar side of the ring finger. Okay, middle and ring finger. So again, to the dorsal digital expansion to the phalanx, they get inserted. Action is abduction and flexion at metacarpophalangeal joint and extension at interphalangeal joint. Apart from that, we look at between the two digits of the first dorsal interosci, the radial artery passes. 
from that dorsum aspect and it is going to enter into the palm by between the two heads of the dorsal intarsial muscles okay so the dorsal intarsial muscle they are adductors or bipinnate muscles first dorsal intarsial to the index finger second and third dorsal intarsial to the middle finger because it has got two dorsal intarsial can be adducted on either wing fourth dorsal intarsial to the ring finger palm intarsial four in number no palm intarsial for middle finger palm intarsial are adductors of the first second fourth and fifth palm intarsial dorsal intarsial eight muscles are supplied by the deep branch of ulnar nerve lumbricus first and second by the median nerve third and fourth by the ulnar nerve deep branch of ulnar nerve so with this we have seen about the dorsal intarsial palm intarsial lumbricus so a little bit on the applied anatomy what is grand canal so you are able to see about the flexor retinal column and the palm carpal uh, ligament the ulnar nerve passes So it is also called as the ulnar tunnel syndrome when the nerve is getting compressed within this canal, which is called as the Guyon's canal, uh, which is actually named after a French uh, physician scientist who found this. It is called as the Guyon's canal. The symptoms include mainly when this is compressed, you have sensory, uh, mainly sensations, pin prick pain you come across. The little finger and medial half of the ring finger. Okay, or paresthesia you come across. Then more advanced stages. What happens? The ulnar nerve. Then intrinsic muscles might get affected. Your lumbricals, palm muscles, or hypothenar muscles, and it might lead to claw hand. Okay, so that is about the Guyon's canal or ulnar tunnel syndrome. Car test is. When you place a sheet of paper or a thin card between the two fingers, checking for the other pass, and when the person who is performing the test when he pulls, you should hold the card against the resistance. Okay. So whether how far your other pass are working again to test the ulnar nerve. Okay. Hold the card tightly as possible when the examiner tries to pull the card. So the power of adductors can be judged. The next test, what you see here, is the Eggerwas test. This is for adductors. So spreading your digits on a table and then you move your middle finger sideways because it has got two dorsal intarsia adductors. Okay, so again, this is to test the dorsal intarsia, which is again to test the integrity of the ulnar nerve. So in total claw hand, what happens is not only this, even the median nerve gets affected. So the last test is to test your adductors. Card test is actually to test your adductors. So today we are actually stopping here for the first part of the part where we have seen about the superficial structures, the deep fascia, and the intrinsic muscles of the part, especially the inner epithelial muscles, lumbrical muscles. And the palm and dorsal intarsia. So we will continue with the palm in the next class. So thank you very much for listening.